Welcome to the Flare Build Podcast. Today's guests are Bogo Gertler and Matt Robinson. Bogo has been involved in the iOS build community since leading Dropbox's transition to Buck in 2019. On GitHub, Bogo maintains ARM to Sim, a tool for deploying legacy iOS frameworks on modern Apple Silicon devices. Bogo is currently working with the platform team at Reddit, slowly moving Reddit's iOS app to Bazel. Matt got involved with the non-Exco build system world by working for a time on the iOS mobile DevX team at Facebook. He then went on to execute various Exco Gen Bazel transitions at both Strava and Reddit. Matt is currently on the same team as Bogo, trying to improve the lives of the iOS engineers at Reddit. Now over to your hosts, Tatiana and Zach the co-founders of Flare Build, the first consultancy and product-based company focused on Bazel. Welcome back. Today, we're joined by Matt Robinson and Bogo Gertler from Reddit. And today, we're talking about their journey to migrate the Reddit iOS application to build with Bazel. Some of you may have seen the excellent blog post, or I guess Reddit post <laughs> in this case, created by Matt and the team covering this stuff. So we're going to do a deep dive into some of the topics covered in that article. And so, yeah, really excited to talk about this today. And this is, of course, you know, another installment of our iOS mini series we've been doing the last couple of weeks here. So obviously, Bogo has been on the show before, but yeah, I think maybe we can start off by handing it over to Matt to kind of give us a high level overview of maybe some of the motivation for getting into Bazel, which is, of course, I think a good starting point. Yeah, I think sort of more broadly, my experience comes from sort of like the Facebook side of the world. So more Buck has like my foundation. But I think I was always interested in that. You know, obviously, these third party build systems provide such a vast array of tools and tooling around them to speed up and make things easier. So I think that's where my interest comes in from like the actual, you know, iOS feature engineer side, which is probably similar to how everyone gets into it on the iOS specific platform side. I think at Reddit, when it comes to this transition and like, you know, making this decision, I joined in July 2021. And largely at that point in time, very, very normal when it comes to, you know, like what the iOS setup was. So that means standard Xcode project, managed in Xcode, all engineers working in the same Xcode project, which as I'm sure we'll touch on outside of anything when it comes to Bazel or these third-party build systems, what have you, that for us didn't scale. And at that point, we really only had a handful of targets and didn't really have, you know, sort of a mechanical way to create more targets, to create really small targets to run really small sets of tests, et cetera, et cetera. All the stuff that you know most of the listeners would probably know Bazel makes very easy. So that was like the simple impetus for the decision for starting on this journey was just simplistically that we were in a place where every other company of our scale and size has decided that it wasn't going to work. And so we also got to that point and made sort of the same decision. Yeah, I was actually surprised to see in the post that you actually weren't using anything for the project. Like nowadays, at least, it seems like at that point, a lot of folks at least would have been using Xcode Gen to avoid the inevitable conflicts editing the project. So I guess that that must have been a really hectic piece of uh, the code base to, to work on. I guess every PR must have been pretty conflict heavy then at that point, right? Yeah. And I think the sort of funny thing, I guess, from our side was that, and and I didn't really include it much in the actual post, but I think it would be really conflict heavy if A, we had a lot of people working in like, let's say the same directory or what have, you know, essentially manipulating the same part of the project, right? For us, it's comical how well it was working for as many people as were in the project at the same time, because I think it was like, we didn't have that many targets in the grand scheme, but we also didn't really have like a super complex way in which like people were adding new targets, which, you know, that changes a substantial part of like the actual project file itself. So I think we were we were definitely getting there, but you know, it's like to enable that target creation, as soon as you get into 50 plus people doing that at any given time, right? You're just gonna it's ripe with problems. So yeah, I think you're totally right in that. I would say I was somewhat surprised too in that when I joined, it was what it was. But yeah. Yeah. And so you mentioned you're kind of getting to the natural limits of you know the sort of the standard tooling with your team size and the size of the project. Do you want to expand a little bit on that? Uh, what were those issues that you're starting to hit with scale? Like, was it 
you know, local build times? What was it CI times? Like what were the sort of the key factors there and sort of evaluating some of these other tools that again, from your experience, you know that the rest of the industry might be using, but what was it within Reddit that sort of drove you to start to evaluate this stuff? I think we were getting to a point and like the amount of code being added was sort of ramping up such that any sort of test that we would have to run, any sort of code change that we'd have to run, we would have to run the entire build. And luckily for us, the local build motivation was probably less and is still less maybe than a lot of companies. But I think for us, it was largely... I mean, that's like sort of... <laughs> I probably poorly highlighted in the post potentially, but it's like, it wasn't necessarily like a particular build time or anything like that. Like our CI build times were definitely getting to the point where the toil around you make a change, you have to wait was getting to the point where people would be uncomfortable or, you know, in, in our surveys that we send out, it would be a common thing. I think the original sort of impetus for doing it was... We want to enable people to build stuff in this modular, very pointed, this target does that, that target does that. Like that was huge. And I think for us, it was like, okay, well, you know, we're going to need something else, right? Like at that point, it's something else. And then once that gets to a scale where it's really, really easy to do, you know, then we're having to deal with all the problems that come with having hundreds and hundreds of targets. And so it's like, I think it was sort of maybe sort of different than a lot of motivations in that it wasn't that we were necessarily having a problem. It was actually very proactive mm -hmm. in that we needed to enable a certain type of development. And then, you know, with that, we knew we would come to the case where, you know, now our build times are going to be over an hour on CI. And that's just, you know, that's not something that can happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Cool. Yeah. So obviously in the post, I, I like the timeline you have set up, but it's a pretty cool, like a chronology is a kind of a cool way to approach the you know, I guess talking about what the actual migration effort looked like. But I guess maybe before we jump into, into all that, maybe let's talk about like how you decided to go about it. Like why Xcogen as a first step, for example? Yeah, so the existing project already had some kind of guardrails for modularity set out. And Reddit app still has a pretty substantially sized monolith, but there was already a lot of smaller modules that you could work with and you could describe them. So that seemed like the kind of very natural first step in the transition was to codify the way the code base is organized and discover if there are any kind of unusual build settings, build configurations in Xcode, especially if you know if you don't leverage Xconfigs a lot, it's very easy to just have no idea what each separate library or separate module is using, how it's being built. What are its search paths? So that kind of organizing that and cleaning that up seemed like a very natural first step. Xcode has a very parse kind of uh, module implementation. It's very easy to leap to other modules. But with Xcode Gen, it at least kind of started setting up the kind of first outline we were able to, to start filling the blanks in. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so for the initial move into Xcogen, was this handwritten or how did you deal with you know, like defining these XMLs and, and stuff to begin with? Yeah, I think we came up with like a, a handwritten template that was a reasonable set of um, of targets for each individual module that basically was kind of two parts. One would be the static framework that uh, each individual module was expressed as. And I think we went as far as even expressing the Reddit app itself as a static framework. And the other one would be the content bundles that we would put, you know, the artwork, the bundable items that uh, should be arriving with an individual module. And so kind of migrating to that setup of framework plus bundle obviously required a little bit of messaging of the code in each individual module because you don't really have the main bundle to refer to anymore. You have to have bundle that's specific to the kind of module scope you're executing in. So there was like a little bit of work there, but it had like a pretty awesome payoff in being able to express it, each individual module with its dependencies in terms of just like a pure export gen file. Yeah. The only thing I would add is that I think we were, even though, you know, maybe the amount of code sort of justifies the decision, it was kind of funny in that the target count maybe didn't, you know, it's like we, we were lucky in that, you know, other companies have had to do, you know, scripted solutions for let, let me convert all these targets or let me generate these and then, you know, do some sort of comparison across. Like we were pretty lucky in that we had a pretty understandable set of targets in Xcode. We didn't necessarily say like, while we're doing this, because I think in the, I can't remember the timeline exactly, but it was roughly a month or so that the sort of conversion over took us. A lot of that was just getting it set up, having them in there at the same time as like the Xcode definition, and then making sure that 
once we're ready, they sort of just lived on the file system until we were, you know, ready to pull the switch over and do a comparison to make sure the project is the same. So I think it was really like target count for us was the thing that enabled us to not really have to worry so much about some complex generation side. So lucky on that side, I guess. <laughs> right, right. So you hadn't yet begun the work of defining the granular targets. So the initial move to ex- yeah, Texcogen was, was easy. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And so was there any other value in this initial work that you did to sort of split things up a little bit cleaner? I imagine at this point, you also probably defined a bit of like the XC configs and stuff that maybe didn't exist too much before. So I guess that was probably another thing you were working on. But yeah, was there any other benefit you found in, in kind of moving to a more explicit model here even early on? Yeah, I mean, we had a very explicit kind of template that we were using to describe those modules and their dependencies. And you know, from our prior understanding, because you know, both Matt and I worked on modular build systems before, those were kind of ready to map onto you know, back or basal concepts pretty easily. So there would be kind of less discovery work for us involved in kind of determining which is the basic set of modules we need to kind of go at, where are the tests, you know, how are the tests organized, how all of this is running, once this was done. Like, it wasn't necessarily a one-to-one mapping from Xcode Gen to Bazel targets, but I would say it was maybe like one-to-one-point-one mapping. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Great. And yeah, I wanted to drill deeper into the target granularity on the Bazel side, but I don't think we're quite there yet. So... um I guess other than that, some of the other items that you call out here. So you have this idea of like the Reddit playground. You had to make special allowances for here. Maybe you want to drill into that a bit? Yeah, I can take that one. I think, you know, the concept of a a playground or like a sample application environment is one that people are probably familiar with, but I can like intro it really quick. You know, simplistically, I would say it's like a more codified version of, let's say, like focus or one of those sort of concepts when it comes to, I want a project or a set of targets that are limited in scope such that I can, you know, sort of work on and build and visualize a, a very small subset of whatever I'm interested in. So similar concept that I'm sure a lot of other companies have. We had this idea sort of, I would say it sort of existed before, like it, it sort of existed in the Xcode representation, you know, therefore we had to make some allowances sort of in the transitionary phase to Xcode gen and as well in, you know, the end basal state. But largely because it was actually sort of difficult to like spin up this idea in Xcode itself, you know, because you effectively would have to create an app target and then initialize all of the correct stuff, info P list, you know, scene delegates, et cetera, et cetera. Like that was actually a fairly difficult concept before in that Bogo mentioned earlier, you know, you end up with a target that has who knows what build settings from who knows what, you know, version of Xcode setting these things. They were all very different in that way, but the Xcode gen representation brought it in a, a little bit better in terms of make it very codified in terms of the things it use. It can share things potentially. It can share info plus, it can share setup code, et cetera. And then, you know, even one step further, once it's in Bazel, it becomes essentially a function that takes a set of inputs that are very, very, you know, clear. And, and we always end up with sort of the same structure. I would say it sort of varies across teams for us in terms of how does a team utilize these playgrounds? Do they even have one? Like that sort of stuff. I think because we don't really have like a, a super built out focus idea right now in our project generation, it's sort of our way of like, it's not exactly the same as focus, right? But at least it's like, you can declare very specifically in a build file that this is the target I care about, build this sample application with you know these dependencies, et cetera. It becomes very, very clear in terms of you know what a given team in their playground and their sample application are actually going to work on. So I think we're going to invest more in this as like time goes on, but this is a particular area from my perspective, that having Bazel, having Starlark as, you know, the go between from here's the target declaration to here's a target or a scheme or whatever in Xcode was like super, super powerful for us and for Reddit, just making it super easy to use and, you know, really easy to do validation, really easy to share stuff, et cetera. Yeah, great. And then another thing I think that I saw in the blog post was you also were making a move to using static linking for your internal frameworks. Is that correct? So this was something prior to this, I guess, were you fully dynamic or what did that look like? And what were the changes you were hoping to implement along with this migration? Yeah. So starting out every internal target, which sort of as we've continually mentioned here, there weren't like a, a large amount of them, but every internal target was a dynamic framework bundled into the application. All CocoaPods were dynamic frameworks bundled into the application. So have to pay the normal price that everyone has to pay when it comes to you know, loading these dynamic frameworks with DYLD. So 
you know, sort of the same motivation there. I think we as a group and as many other you know, larger applications have had to focus on, you know, when you have this explosion of targets, once it's really, really easy, then you have to, you know, start being weary because you're going to increase that dynamic load count by so much. Mm -hmm. So we got, and I think maybe I did call it out in the blog list, but, you know, roughly like half a second of very cold launch pre-main time improvements, even with our like pretty minimal set of dynamic targets. But obviously, Mm -hmm. as we sort of took it as this was a part of the migration that needed to happen such that we don't, get in trouble later and and can't sort of effectively it's sort of to bogo's point earlier like us coming up with the way that we at reddit bundle resources for a target and having that very codified from the start made it so that it really wasn't very hard for us to you know people were very familiar with how to use it and then once we sort of switched to this basil build that sort of is definitely designed such that it links everything statically if it can it was much, much easier to do that transition because the code was already set up to do it just for the pre-main benefits that we got, you know, sort of pre-finishing the migration to Bazel. I think the one thing I would add, and maybe this is like sort of a higher level thing with all of this, is I think we knew where we were trying to get to, right? Like we knew we were trying to get to the Bazel reality, but we had to do sort of all these little things in between. And because it was me and Bogo working on it, it allowed us to get away from Xcode while one of us is working on sort of this other migration at the same time. And so this is one of those particular things where I could focus on how are we going to package and statically link all of our libraries while Bogo can look into, okay, we're developing that infrastructure sort of one by one as we go through our set of targets. Now he can start spinning up these makeshift basal rules, makeshift basal targets to make everything work. And so a lot of it you'll see in sort of our process was designed for like parallelization in mind such that we can sort of move both things forward in the Xcode representation simplistically and like the, you know, our sort of future basal representation as well. I know that was a long answer to your question, but sort of the gist. Sure. Yeah. So I know you guys built a couple of tools to help you with even just the initial move to Xcode gen. So I think you had like some project differ and then some other tool to do Xcode gen generation. (laughs) So maybe, maybe Bogo, do you want to expand a little bit on that? Sure. Actually, I think this might be better for Matt because Matt specifically sure. worked on okay. the, the project diffing and expo gen gen. So those okay. are like good Matt topics. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think th- this is one of the things that I tried to call in the blog post, especially because, you know, to Zach's earlier question, like we didn't have a system sort of manually or, or sort of automatedly converting and creating these targets. And so for us, in that sort of initial Xcode to Xcode gen transition, we wrote a project differ that would essentially take the things we deemed important for all targets in Xcode and say, you know, compare the left to the right and just tell us sort of the difference between that representation, which sort of as we move through the process, like at the beginning, it was okay. These are the settings we need to move into an XC config because they're different across targets and they shouldn't be, as an example. And so in sort of that initial phase, it was more like, here's what we need to align between these targets that sort of is weird once you have like a very simplistic Xcode gen target definition. And you know, sort of similarly, that tool, once we were like, okay, we are now on the Xcode gen representation, and now we're going to move to what I call Xcode gen gen, which you know isn't a super great name, but it works. Once we move towards that, then we can say, okay, let's compare the Xcode gen representation to like the Bazel generated representation, because in theory, you know, they, they don't necessarily need to be the same, but they should be relatively close in that sense. So I think for us, especially doing the manual target conversion, both in the Xcode to Xcode gen and the Xcode gen to Bazel stuff, like having the ability for us to understand what does the project look like before and after and get a comparison was hugely helpful as a sanity check when we would make these big, say, you know, delete the project and, and make sure that the representation from before and after is right. So that was essential for sure in our process. I think it's interesting from the perspective that I think a lot of the focus when it comes to, you know, Bazel and how it integrates with Xcode is like, do you want to build with Bazel in Xcode or do you want to not, right? Like that's the, that's sort of the thing. And there's all these tools that already exist when it comes to, you have these Bazel target definitions. I want to get a project, an Xcode project that I can do some stuff with, whether that be XE Hammer or whether that be Xcode project from Rolls iOS, you know, various different approaches. And for us, I think those were sort of hard to use in the way that we made the transition. And so we effectively just wrote like a simplistic layer that said like, here, I'm going to declare a Xcode gen spec for this target and created a simple Bazel rule that does that, you know, like essentially just writes out roughly what existed before on the file system from a Bazel target declaration. But that was important for us. And like, we're still using it today, but it was important for us because 
we sort of did this very piecewise migration as we moved through targets. And so it, when we made the transition from Xcode Gen to Bazel as our project generator, we didn't do it all as, you know, 100% flip the switch, we're, we're going to move all the way over. It was more like work from sort of the bottom of the build graph up and say, okay, I'm moving this particular framework into the Bazel is the source of truth for this particular target. And so we sort of had to have this like hybrid custom implementation for you know, more or less like an Xcogen spec generator, because we would sort of basically, you know, feed in sort of the old representations that were from Xcogen, the new representations that end up, you know, built by Bazel, feed those all to Xcogen and just get sort of the project that roughly would have been the same. That was like the important, that's sort of why it existed and, you know, why we reinvented the wheel for, you know, the fifth or sixth time <laughs> when it comes to project generation. Right. So I imagine that the outputs of this rule were mostly just the Xcogen definitions though. So were you actually building, if you built the target with Bazel, was it actually building anything with Bazel and like the standard like rules Apple stuff? Was it building the library at all or was it only generating the project definition? You were definitely able to, you know, run tests from all those modules because what Matt was describing was our move of the kind of modularized part of the code base. In our case, it lived all in a modules directory. And, you know, we were able to generate all those specs that would then integrate the kind of monolith part of the application. But as a part of this transition, we also decided to be able to run tests in CI, I mean, first locally, then in CI, using all of those target definitions. So very early on, before we even moved the main app over, we were able to run in CI and get code coverage for all of the modularized Reddit code. And that was also like a big win of the entire transition. The monolith, as anybody who ever tried to break down monolith like knows, it's really messy to work with. It usually involves like a lot of that parse kind of module structure, direct imports, kind of unclear build rules. And that kind of let us kick that can very far down the road and focus on the place where the impact is the largest, which is kind of enabling our engineers to add new modules very fast and kind of have this understandable DAG they work with. Maybe once in a while, they have to kind of dive into the monolith, but enabling that modularity by the end of last year was like a very, very big step for us. Mm -hmm. And so you were building and testing those modules with Bazel as well, at least in CI, just the local dev workflow was, of course, using the generated projects. Yeah, uh-huh, cool. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's like definitely a great way. We we talk a little bit about migration patterns here, obviously, from time to time. And yeah, like that's a great way to go about it if you can. Like pick some edge of the, the build graph and work your way in. Yeah, very cool. And is this I'm kinda curious if this is like a, a piece of code you've considered open sourcing at all? Um I knew this was gonna come up. Bogo and I talked about this. Um yes. Yeah, and like I, I had plans to, and then Brentley sort of stole my thunder with uh, Rules X Code Proj. I think ours is unique in that it is simplistically a basal declaration of what you would declare in Xcode Gen anyway. And, and the one thing I wanted to sort of stress in the post is that you know we got benefits having these, these targets have their source of truth be basal long before we ever built with basal. That as like, you know, using the traditional rules, Apple or, or whatever sort of build and test approach, like we got a lot from it. And so that's, <laughs> I mean, that's ultimately why I would love to open source it because I think it's like, it's sort of this natural transitionary phase where if we had this, when we were trying to make the decision, okay, we're going to move from Xcode gen in theory, you could have moved from Xcode to like our rule set yeah, yeah. sort of, you know, before and, and, and sort of skip the intermediary phase where we didn't have this tool that we built. So mm -hmm. we're definitely considering it. I just want to, you know, be mindful that it's potentially likely that we're going to switch away from it. And I don't want to open source it and have it just sort of be languishing when we don't use it internally. So, so we'll, we'll sort of see, yeah. see the future of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, totally makes sense. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting tool to use sort of like as a bridge like you did, right? Like it's obviously not the ideal end state, but I think it's useful because I think a lot of people will probably already be using Xcode gen by the time they come to making the move to Bazel. That seems to be the trend, like I said. So I think being able to have like a hybrid where you have some stuff generated, some stuff handwritten Xcode gen, I think that that, that would be useful. But yeah, I, I do also agree that there's just a <laughs> too much of an explosion probably of various means of generating projects that are often doing a lot of the same stuff. I mean, even some of the older uh, like XC Hammer, for example, like that has been generating projects for at least five years that work like that use Xcode build or Bazel already. Like that's a feature we've had in the community for years. And 
under the hood, it's using Tulsi even, which is, yeah, Corey, we can talk definitely more. I know you guys are using some of that stuff too. So yeah. So in any case, yeah, I, I do hope that as a community, you know, we can kind of figure out like a good place to sort of land on, centralize on a bit to combine our efforts is for these, these project generators. Uh, but this one, I think it's almost like as long as it's, the emphasis is that it's a tool and not necessarily like the ideal end state, I think that there's maybe some value in it for other folks. So yeah, definitely, definitely something we continue to talk about in the future and see how it goes. I, I do agree. Yeah, just another piece of abandoned war isn't necessarily that useful either. Um, yeah, and we'll see. I think it's close to a state where it would make sense. And we'll have the the conversations internally, whether we have time to do it or not, sort of as we determine where we're headed. Because I think, like you say, like, you know, one of the, the powerful thing to us is the community behind all the tools. So mm-hmm. I would much rather be on the tool that everybody's on as opposed to our own <laughs> yeah. in this particular space. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So at this point, you know, your modularization effort is done. You've moved to static frameworks. You've got, you know, a little bit of code gen going on. How has the daily experience of like an engineer on your team changed? Like if, if we want to go to say, to find a new module, how did that look before? And how does it look now? I imagine there's probably some improvements to the developer experience here. Yeah, definitely. I, I think you would originally, you know, always have to start with adding a target in expert project. And if you're moving stuff, like obviously you're going to have a really bad time merging that project on GitHub. If you move to right now, you're basically starting a new directory, putting a, a build Bazel file using one of the couple of macros we have defined for folks that allow them to tap both into Bazel and into the auxiliary tooling that Reddit uses, for example, for internationalization. And from there, you just need to add it to the DAG and uh, you will have some form of uh, your modularized code building. So that cycle is much shorter. It does require you to become a little bit more familiar currently with at least how to cargo call to the existing Bazel macro in the code base. And, you know, we are hoping to develop tooling that will be just kind of a one-liner to, to instantiate a new target using our kind of structure of macros and targets that we prefer to use. Yeah, great. Sounds like a big improvement. Great. Yeah, and so uh, were there any other tools that you created along the way to sort of help you internally here? I see someone made a note. Strings Gen, is that something uh, worth touching on? Yeah, Strings Gen, actually, I think just kind of unlocks like this part just unlocks the entire part of the discussion about how awesome Bazel was for us to kind of streamline the tooling. You know, as anybody who has kind of a crusty iOS code base that's been kind of developing over the years, you know, you, you end up with a lot of tools for beat code gen, some kind of like support linting, you know, distributing the binaries that you might need to be using as a part of the build process. And with Bazel, we we're just able to kind of bring all of this together. Strings Gen is an internal tool. Uh, Reddit's, you know, we used to provide internationalization to the entire app. And typically you would have to run it manually as a part of your code, uh, code check-in. Uh, you know, obviously that is prone to mistakes. You have to lint for it. Now, you know, you just have a, a field in your macro where you just put the base internalization files that you need to work with. And that is just integrated as the part of the entire build process. At Reddit, we have a slight preference for checking in generated code into the repo. So there is a minimal amount of redoing the code when you want to build. And that definitely helps in supporting that because it gives you this kind of additional layer of abstraction on top of uh, the templates you might be working with or on top of, you know, even third-party code, you might need to adjust. A big change for us, and that might come up later, was, you know, integrating CocoaPods directly into our Bazel project and being able to define macros in which we are kind of able to override some internal definitions of those CocoaPods without actually affecting the code on disk was a very big quality of life improvement for us uh, because it let us kind of have a set of patches we need to build in Bazel and just keep the kind of Xcode safe code around as well and have a very kind of understandable diff between those two systems as opposed to kind of having, you know, build this with one system, this with the other system, and just kind of have a very confusing kind of cornucopia of different copies of the same code in our repo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, so I think that's like definitely a good transition into, so you've, you set yourself up with Xcode Gen, you're using Bazel to generate Xcode Gen configs, but maybe talk through how you were able to transition from this state to a state where you're actually uh, building things with Bazel natively. And then, yeah, we touched on project generation a little bit, but obviously 
when we start talking about basal native builds, yeah, there are a plethora of options out there that new adopters will have to sort of choose, okay, do we want to try to use the Google way of doing things and make use of Tulsi directly? Do we take a look at XC Hammer, which is obviously a little out of date at this point? And then we've got, of course, the great work going on in Rules iOS. And there's a lot of different options for folks. And so maybe talk us through how you approach this problem that you inevitably would have run into, I guess, at this point in the migration. I think for us, like the most difficult part of the migration, and like it's it's important to know that our in state, or at least our current state, I guess it's not our in state, but our, our current state is that engineers right now still build with Xcode build locally. So on CI, a lot of our builds are are using test builds, all UI test builds. Those are all using Bazel to build the application and you know the test bundles. But locally, we're sort of still in a state where, at least right now, which we're sort of evaluating, it, it still makes sense for us to not sort of introduce the Bazel complication just yet. Mm-hmm. I would say that's largely just because of you know the new M1 machines are fast enough and so generally quick for our code base that it sort of maybe bought us six to twelve months of like the ability to sort of put off that sort of decision. So I guess the answer to your question is we sort of really didn't. I think the the hardest part of, of the migration at the point where we were saying like, okay, we need to build the application for UI tests or for consumption of, uh, you know, on, on a device or, or what have you. The migration of our monolith was no doubt the most complex part of our actual migration when it came to unifying, like, how can we make the build as close as possible between these two representations? Because they are, you know, they're slightly different and have nuances across them. For us in that way, and you know, one of the powerful things that folks very familiar with Bazel will know is that you know, select statements are super powerful when it comes to you know, doing things per config or doing things per, you know, per whatever. For us, we leaned on those a lot to be able to say sort of opinionatedly, I would think that you generate the project for a particular configuration. And that's just a line we drew in the sand. And, you know, that comes with its own set of complications, but it it at least makes it very clear for us, you know, what are you building in Xcode? What do you depend on? And making that very config dependent such that when you generate the project, it has that same exact representation as it would have, you know, within the Bazel DAG as well, just as a way to make sure that we keep them as close as possible representations. I would say that maybe we're living on the edge slightly and that, you know, things like the way our cocoa pods are built in Bazel is statically linked into our binary, whereas in the Xcode representation, it's not. So there's definitely things that we even, for the sake of our UI tests, have accepted that are different for right now. And I would say, well, it hasn't bit us yet, but it seems to be working well and that it's very, very close, but it's, you know, some things are different about how a given thing is tested and used locally, maybe compared to, you know, what's the validation that's occurring sort of on the CI side. So, it, mm-hmm. so yeah. Well, I, I like the the sound of the generated projects are, yeah, they map directly to like a specific config in Bazel, which is nice because I, I know a lot of folks expect that the generated projects will look exactly like they looked before and they'll have, you know, a million different schemes and targets and all that stuff. And I, I, I'm not a huge fan of that myself because it, it feels like, yeah, like, the, okay, well, I, I think philosophically, yeah, your approach sounds ideal to me. Yeah. And for us, like so many of our decisions, like Bogo mentions with the piping all of our CocoaPods target declarations through an internal macro, which CocoaPods Basil makes really easy. It really is just all to simplify our lives more so than maybe like the end user, like particularly while we're doing the transition and while we're trying to be opinionated about what workflows do we support actively and what other things can you do if you need to, but ultimately you're sort of on the edge of what you know we consider like a supported thing internally. And that, that's worked well for us, especially when we had one to two people at all times <laughs> available to help and you know fix issues and that sort of thing. Okay, so yeah, true like full basal builds with the next code, not accomplished yet. That's on the on the roadmap for a future effort, it sounds like though. Yeah, we definitely want to ship basal builds at some point in the future, but right now I think we are kind of in a pretty comfortable spot with a back style build where, you know, our project is generated and, you know, Xcode build is just being very close to to the basal state of the world. There is really nothing worse that you can give to your kind of end customer than, you know, a build that works locally and just fails in CI for an obscure flag reason. So it's definitely like a big point for us to make sure that this doesn't happen until we complete the migration. But the cost of doing that has you know, not kind of been significant enough yet to kind of just put this as a thing we need to do right now. We still have some ways to go with modularizing the code base, 
organizing our our monolith and, and kind of preparing that before we get to the point where we can you know build everything of basil and release the apps through basil and all of those uh, kind of awesome end, end goals for us right yeah absolutely so i guess you know you mentioned cocoa pots basil let's drill in a little bit on how yeah so you're using basil to manage at least your external dependencies which is probably yeah, a huge win so so obviously cocoa pots basil that's coming from rules ios right so maybe let's talk about what rule sets you've deployed so far for building and testing the modules that are built with basil and sort of yeah what all that looks like yeah we use your rules ios we use rules apple do we use rules swift directly matt I- I think we might use them transitively. Yeah, yeah transitively, not directly. Hood. Yeah. And then we CocoaPods Basil as a plugin for CocoaPods to generate our pod Basil files. The thing there is that Reddit has historically been using CocoaPods as its third party solution. We tried working with other solutions, be it Cartage or SDM, as ways of kind of delivering third party code. And they have not proven, you know, as kind of you act, they didn't have such a good UX that we were able to achieve with CocoaPods so far. So we deployed CocoaPods Basil and, you know, massive kudos for the community work on this, like Sam Giddens and that whole crew from Square working on this project, like really kind of unlocked the option for us to make a very fast transition on all third party code that we are using. And so that really kind of helped us align the, the handling of third party code. Yeah. The one interesting thing that I think we ran into and sort of like Bogo mentioned earlier, you know, we, we sort of always lean towards checking things in such that like the state of the repository is hopefully you can just, you know, build it from there sort of simplistically. And the CocoaPods case was kind of a funny one where because of the way we did our project migration, we sort of ended up with this chicken and egg problem where, well, our target declarations in our internal modules aren't valid unless CocoaPods exists, but CocoaPods can't run unless the project exists. And so it was like kind of this this funny circular thing initially when we were sort of still doing a very simplistic like, okay, generate the project, run CocoaPods, and that's like sort of how everything works out. So this is another sort of internal tool that we actually just relatively recently built to Zach's earlier question, where the approach of having CocoaPods sort of in the pathway directly always of generating our build files, it worked for a while, but sort of exact same problem as like when we started this whole migration, then you have everybody touching the pod file when they add a target, if they need to sort of duplicate this declaration of, okay, I have a declaration in my build file, but that's kind of generated by CocoaPods Basil. So then that means the build file also needs to declare that dependency. So we just ended up with a, a ton of merge conflicts in our checked in pod file and in our checked in CocoaPods lock file as well. Right, right. And so we went the path of sort of keeping like a reference implementation or not a reference implementation, but just like a reference folder that has, this is our CocoaPods that we need. And very simplistically, that is where the CocoaPods code is stored that is checked in and can be referenced by Bazel, but it sort of dejected the need for us to have CocoaPods Bazel actually in the pathway of running it more frequently than just like when you needed to change the set of third-party dependencies that you, that you like actually depend on. And then we can generate the project's actual pod file from the Bazel declarations by knowing you know that they depend on all these things. That eliminated a whole class of merge conflicts that, that occur very commonly when people are adding targets and tests pretty frequently. But that was kind of one of those things that didn't really crop up until it was very common for people to be adding targets or manipulating cocoa pods or, you know, sort of either of those two things as we increased our target count. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So you mentioned you had some mechanism for patching that you really, really like. So I want to drill in a little deeper on that. So yeah, maybe walk us through like the patching. I, I'm actually not super familiar with CocoaPods Basil. Is this just using like a patch feature that's built into that rule by default? Or is this something you built on top of that? So in our case, we run into a couple of kind of rules, iOS, rules, Apple edge cases. One of them is, I believe, under the hood rules, Apple does not support C++ as a part of your kind of build description. I think you can build a separate C++ library, but if it's just like a member of your target, it's not going to get built. And we've been using for a while this, I think at this point, archived Facebook SDK by Adam Bell, I think, uh, called Pop. It was from like this really all like Facebook paper project, you know, for doing like really nice 3D animations. And I think that is an example of like a library that used C++ directly 
would not have been able to build it under Bazel. We did not want to fork it and do kind of changes to it uh, by hand. So a very simple fix there was actually to take that C++ files and make it Objective-C++ because mm -hmm. it's a valid subset of the language. And, you know, something as easy as kind of even renaming a file, you would typically have to now fork that repo, make the change, push that repo. Now you have to maintain a fork. I mean, pop is unlikely to receive updates, but this is a good example of something where, you know, by having a macro that would, you know, modify the files and then just pipe it all to the build, we were able to make a much better kind of UX for our engineers because we had a very clear understanding of uh, the changes we need to apply to individual files, be it renames, maybe uh, add an import or, you know, run a set on a file because it imports using like too permissive of a namespace. And so any kind of patches like this, you know, until they were accepted upstream, we were able to maintain them locally uh, mm -hmm. very easily using just typical generals that mm -hmm. would, you know, take files and modify them, output them, modify the build graph and uh, make Bazel happy. Yeah, it's great. And that's a very basally approach, right? Where we apply oftentimes patches to external things we're pulling in sort of, yeah, at, at that point in time. Okay, cool. Yeah. So at this point, I'm, I'm curious to talk a little bit more about like, yeah, like what's next on your roadmap? And where do you see that the most value that Basil will deliver next for you here? I think immediately, it's, you know, to your earlier point, Zach, it's, it's us getting to a point where the application that we build locally matches the CI, you know, sort of process as closely as possible. And so, you know, probably unifying around some solution where we actually build with Basil inside of Xcode itself. That's sort of like the immediate one that we have on our map. I think Bogo, I think mentioned earlier, like we're in a funny place where we have been and are doing a lot of modularization of our monolith, but sort of like, that's what we need to keep doing to actually... <laughs> see a lot of success when it comes to, you know, building a lot of small parts or, or caching a lot of small parts across builds. Like we're just in this place where we still have a lot of code in our monolith. And so getting away from there is the combination of those two things, sort of one to unlock the other is like our immediate plan. And then I think similar to the, the stuff that folks from Lyft and maybe folks from Airbnb have published as well, get to a much more opinionated sort of setup when it comes to you know, treat targets that exist within our project less as like, these are just all static frameworks and that's what they are. And more like this type of static framework, whether it be the interface for a module or, you know, the implementation of a module, getting opinionated there in the actual build graph and in our internal Bazel macros and rules to really enforce whatever we deem as correct when it comes to, you know, the dependency structure that we have. So those two things are immediately what we're working on sort of both to facilitate the other because right now we're sort of, I would say, in the infancy of the modularization that we've done, which, I mean, shout out to the rest of our team. Bogo and I, to be fair, haven't done a lot of modularization. That's not really what we focused on. We sort of enable it more than anything else. But just a lot of good work there coming from across the company and sort of bringing it to fruition and, and making it work within all of our stuff really well. Yeah, I was, I was away for a couple of months. And uh, when I returned, I think I opened the Xco like the first time after the, I did make projects. And uh looked at the, the module count. And I think when I was living, it was like 20 modules-ish. I, I think it's like north of 100 at this point uh, mm -hmm. of at least targets showing up in Xcode. So I know it's just like really awesome to see this kind of explosion of adoption of modules where like this became kind of almost the default way of encapsulating your code and kind of reasoning about your dependencies. And I mean, obviously, Xcode is, uh, you know, not super happy about such a number of targets. So we'll have to figure out ways around it. But it's just really awesome to see this kind of adoption and to help drive it. Yeah, that's great. And one thing you called out in your blog post is that the lines of code count, at least the Swift lines of code count, basically doubled over the last, you know, the year that you're taking a look at in the write-up. And the Objective-C was reduced by a little bit, but not the same magnitude, of course. And... I'm curious if part of your effort here on modularization is also maybe demixing and what your state of the world is over there with like mixed source modules, because obviously that is a, uh, a constant point of pain for folks, especially when they first start off with Bazel. So yeah, what does that all look like for you? Yeah, one of the obvious reasons that rules iOS as an idea was sort of our default rule set is because, you know, we were lucky enough that all of our, well, most of our targets out of the box just sort of worked more or less, given that well, all old targets are mixed Objective-C and Swift, and basically all new ones aren't. Most new ones will be Swift only. How do I answer your actual question, though? I think, so we've had various 
objectives of reducing the objective C, obviously all new stuff is going to be swift. I think we sort of started down a pathway where actively maybe, you know, approaching it be what people call the lift way of, you know, just go actively get rid of all of the objective C. For our code base, we were able to get a decent amount done that way. I think we sort of ran into a point where ours is just so like rats nesty when it comes to being able to separate it that we just sort of ran into a wall there where I think for now we're less focused on actively doing it. But, you know, our code base isn't wildly mixed, I would say, just given that the amount of Swift that we have and and all that. I think for us, and I know I keep coming back to it, but really it's the monolith is the connector for all this stuff. It causes a lot of problems because it's just one huge, mostly, you know, it is the most mixed of all of our code bases from all of our targets. And so that one is such a focus for us to make it smaller such that we at least have an understandable landscape of what are the targets that could be Objective-C and Swift split and that. But yeah, I'd say no active effort to actually do a, you know, go into the targets and rewrite the Objective-C or split out the Swift and the Objective-C at this point. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely for some organizations, yeah, the idea of demixing is just it's not going to happen. So, yeah, totally understandable. So, go ahead. As a part of transition, you also, I think we needed to approach the kind of Objective-C, Swift Objective-C sandwich. And, you know, Xcode is extremely permissive about being able to just like go from layer to layer because of the order of build you have in Bazel. Like we're not able to do that. So for us, reorganizing the sandwich, even before we would touch any rewrite was like the big part of the whole effort. Yeah, absolutely. I know that there are some recent performance optimizations and rules iOS around the mixed source modules. So I'm curious if this was something you observe any benefit from, because I think it, there was maybe earlier like an on-disk model and that moved to in-memory for some of like the virtual file system stuff. Was that something that were you, I'm, I, I guess I don't really remember the timeline specifically on that. Is that something like you were observing like poor performance and were able to like flip on some flags to see any performance gains there? Uh, or is that something that you just kind of already got out of the box? It's a very timely question because I just did an analysis this morning of the flags. So very great timing. So I think so much of our effort in the, at least the time covered by the write-up, we were strictly just trying to do the migration. It was much less like in-depth, what is the difference in the time between these two different options, especially while we're still like, it's becoming more important now as we sort of weigh, can we efficiently have engineers building with Bazel locally and using that as their main you know, build system? So now I would say we're trying to sort of at least wrap our heads around that situation. But I think as part of the migration, you know, it was like, we're effectively just trying to get stuff working more or less. I would say that, you know, sort of to your point, without these flags, you got to have like tribal knowledge to, or like, you know, <laughs> read the source code to actually know about us switching over, like a lot of people experience is dramatically slower. Like the default configuration is slower for us. And just this morning, you know, yeah, flipping on the flags, like you mentioned, the, the ability to actually share the module cache and the ability to have the virtual frameworks as well. Like both of those give us, if you take a look at our entire application build time, gives us a roughly 40% speed increase, clean build increase by just flipping on those flags. So yeah, I, I would stress that to everyone listening like that, it's important that you sort of take an understanding of that landscape because it's significant when it comes to, if your code base works with those flags, it's, it's like hugely impactful. Yeah, yeah. The thing is that Bazel, and this is something we, we talked about with Jerry yesterday, but yeah, Bazel like, is really just adding pure overhead until it starts to actually deliver on incrementality and stuff. So like, if it's a clean build, it should be slower. And then, of course, the iOS ecosystem suffers from plenty of other challenges, like sandboxing is a classic example because of the way the module cache works, which, yeah, we, we've been trying to solve that. But you know, if you naively just run a sandbox build, you're doing so much extra work You know, for every single action you're rebuilding you know, the module cache, and it'll be 100x slower or whatever. But um, I have I haven't independently verified this, but some numbers we were taking a look at is if you were to take the large kind of classic CocoaPods open source app and compare its Xcode build times to its Bazel build times with Rules iOS, it should be about four times faster now with uh, all of the secret flags. And then if we add remote cache execution to that, maybe another 10x. So you know, maybe up to 40x faster was, I think, the number that me and Jerry arrived on uh, yesterday. But uh, no, no one has verified that yet. So I think the next challenge is probably to go grab what are the open source Telegram or Kickstarter and... Uh, and see if this is actually true in practice, because those are some big promises there. But um, 
Yeah, definitely uh, excited to kind of see as you start to kind of compare this stuff with your app, you know, going forward, I think maybe hopefully there's some more data you can share there. This should be pretty exciting to take a look at. Yeah, I think the initial, like, I don't know if we even had it really in our heads that test selection was going to be a focus for our initial sort of rollout. But for the reasons you mentioned and having like an extremely primitive cache in our initial implementation, when we rolled it out, like it was dramatically slower when it comes to our CI machines. And so it was like test selection, which, you know, obviously Basil sort of enables us to be able to actually like do that reasonably. But test selection was sort of our like, okay, well, we've done all this work. We need to have some realized gains without being able to have the time to dig super deep into flags, caches, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, <laughs> it's kind of a funny end to the initial set of work of like, okay, we want to be using Bazel as our source of truth and we do it and it's not faster and having to have some sort of answer to that. For us, it was test selection originally and you know improving on all this stuff sort of down the road, like mm-hmm. we're finally getting to now. So. Uh huh. So I want to drill in a little bit on this. So out of the box, of course, do you have any way of preserving your state, whether that's a disk cache on some shared volume in CI or even the output directory persists between runs, which I don't necessarily recommend, but, or of course, the remote cache and execution servers. Ideally, Bazel will not be running tests it doesn't need to run unless something has actually invalidated that part of the build graph. So tell me about what this idea of test selection looks like in your current implementation. Yeah, so I do think that's like great like context for our setup in that if you're able to share, you know, whether it be a, a network drive or what have you across your runs, that's obviously going to be much better than a clean VM. But in our case, we just have a clean VM every single time we run our builds. So, you know, that's important context for what's going to work for us better than or like what's going to be our starting situation when it comes to, you know, even if it is a cache build, it's going to have to actually get all that information from the actual remote cache. So for us, it was just simplistically using the open source tender implementation for test selection. And for us, we're sort of funny in that, like, I know we, we keep going back to it, but because our monolith is so big, we sort of essentially run two CI jobs where one job is all of our modules tests, those are test selected. And then the other job is our sort of massive monolith set of unit tests with a test host that is the Reddit app itself. So in those situations, like even though the code at this point is probably a lot larger in the case of our modules tests and like there's more tests running, et cetera, that runs faster still than, you know, on the P50, on the P90 compared to the Reddit test one, because it just has to build sort of, you know, build or download the world. And test selection is a, a huge part of that for us. And I think we've been, once again, you know, shout out to the community from our side, because we've just largely been able to stand on the shoulders of giants here and, and use those open source projects to sort of spin it up quickly inside of our infrastructure to, to give us those wins. So you're seeing using just Bazel diff at the front end and no real caching. Otherwise, you're actually seeing performance improvements over the standard pipeline in CI. Is that correct? You're just using that to close the gap. (laughs) It's more that, yeah. More like in the original implementation, to your earlier question, we didn't really have time to focus on like what is slow about our implementation and why, and more how can we quickly bridge the gap between you know what we had before and what we have now. And obviously, test selection as an idea is a very simple, if it just works, it's a very simple thing to sort of integrate into Mm -hmm. your, your CI process. Gotcha. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone using just the Bazel diff on the front end, but that's great. It's actually a really interesting use case for Bazel and the related tooling that like, rather than the incrementality that Bazel would give you, you're just querying the build graph and using like a very Bazel-y inspired sort of philosophy of checking inputs, you know, hashes and things like that to actually figure out what to do. And then sort of, <laughs> but even without like the Bazel side of the caching, still seeing some improvements. That's pretty cool. And that was like one of the, who is the author of Basil Diff? I can't think of his Max, name right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, anyway. Maxwell, yeah. Yeah, Maxwell from Tinder. He, we've had a handful of conversations with him just about it because I think, you know, sort of grand vision is much more similar to what you say, Zach, where it's like sort of treat it as our build router. If we can trustworthily use it, treat it as the thing that kicks off our builds more so than the sort of hacked way we're using it now. And it's like really make it as our, you know, what, for, for every given commit, what is the set of targets that have changed just to understand that landscape across all commits in all of our repositories, just to help us make decisions better on the front end rather than yeah, yeah sort of when we're running in that sort of situation. Yeah, we actually just did a podcast episode with him about that. And so that'll be coming out soon. So yeah, we dive really, awesome. really deep into all this. But yeah, I'm really interested in that tool because this is, this is definitely a missing part of Basil where 
And it's definitely a different use case than you're thinking about. But if we imagine like a code base with millions and millions of lines of code, even if you were to use something like Bazel tests dot dot dot, you know, the wildcard that would expand to all the targets. The challenge there is actually like, yeah, at the end of the day, Bazel might analyze all the targets and then figure out, okay, I only need to build two targets. But the problem is if you have like an actual huge monorepo, like some companies building at scale do, that loading and analysis phase can take hours, right? So like imagine you do that at the Google monorepo or whatever, right? Like it's never going to complete. So this idea of just using the wildcards is actually goes completely out the window at scale, right? And so that's where a tool like Bazel Diff is interesting because it actually allows us to say, okay, actually Bazel build, like even if it's a thousand targets, like Bazel test these a thousand targets, uh, that's still going to be way more effective than like scanning the whole code base, right? So I think that's sort of the core motivation. And yeah, I mean, after our conversation, I, I think like ideally we, we would just like to see this implement somehow in Bazel, you know, sort of by default. And we talked a little bit about what some of the challenges there are. But yeah, that's, I think that, that would be great at some point if you could just say like Bazel build like affected or Bazel CI or whatever you want to call it. And that would be a very nice piece of functionality, but doesn't seem like it's happening anytime soon. Well, cool. Yeah, this is great. Are there any other themes or topics that we haven't really touched on that are at the top of your mind uh, during this migration? I don't think I have anything, Bogo. Do you? I think we covered majority of, yeah, of, of our migration story. Great. Cool. So um, yeah, I imagine you might be looking for some additional help on these projects. So yeah, is, is that the case, uh, Matt? Is this something you want to talk about? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we are, um, Bogo and I are members of the, the apps platform team at Reddit and, you know, sort of similar to platform teams at all companies, always looking to hire more people. We have roles open for iOS. We have roles open for Android as well. So a lot of opportunities to come affect this sort of stuff if, if it's your jam. Sweet. And uh, do you guys have any social accounts or anything you want to plug here? No takers? Okay. Boga, I know you've got a great blog. You want to throw that out? <laughs> sure. Uh, you have the, the worksafebogo.dev or the last worksafebogo.wtf. <laughs> great. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we touched on this on our, one of our last episodes, but yeah, the, the ARM64 articles, uh, ARM64 to SIM articles you did, of course, are great. The community has really enjoyed those. So, all right, guys, thanks a lot. This has been cool. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to having you back on to discuss, you know, the, the future states of the project that we see on the horizon here. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for your time. Thank you, you all. Oh, thanks, Zach. Thank you for tuning in to the Flare Build Podcast. Please like, subscribe, and tune in again with Zach and Tatiana for the next podcast in the series.